During our last episode, in part one of our interview with Ross Shellhaus, he talked about his combat experience in 2008 in Afghanistan with 2nd Battalion, 7th Marine Regiment, Box Company. This week, in part two of that interview on Warriors Roundtable. You have to be vulnerable. Marine and vulnerable are not synonymous. The service personnel's job is so critical, yet a lot of these spouses are single parents because you're gone so much. Post-traumatic stress is a natural reaction to a situation in which your life Mm -hmm. is in danger or you have to take life. Your part in the war ends and you go home, but your mind hasn't made that transition. You're still assessing threat. You're still looking for the bad guys. You're still thinking about all those things that you've conditioned your mind to, to do. Face your enemy head on in a violent, high tempo manner and not surrender. You don't give up in the face of the enemy. And we don't do that when we are presented with hardship. Ask for help. Ask somebody for that. Because that's, that to me is where courage exists. The views and opinions in this podcast do not represent the Department of Defense, Department of the Navy, or United States Marine Corps. After their deployment in 2008, some called them the Forgotten Battalion. But the Marines and sailors of the United States Marine Corps' 2nd Battalion and 7th Marine Regiment reject the way the Forgotten Battalion moniker encourages that narrative of broken veterans. Instead, these warriors simply want to be remembered for the mission they accomplished and for the honor with which they have served their country and their corps. The majority of 2-7 veterans continue to reflect on their experiences while living their lives and pressing forward. These are their personal stories of resilience with insight to healthy coping and living with hope. Welcome to the Warriors Roundtable. Today on the Roundtable, part two of a two-part interview with former company commander for Fox 2-7, Ross Shellhaas. So, Ross, I'm sure you could probably write a book about Fox Company's deployment in 2008 with 27. That was fantastic. Thanks for, for sharing all that. I want to ask you a little bit about some of your own personal challenges that you had to deal with and your Marines may or may not have known about. But we all have personal challenges, difficulties that are happening parallel to what we're experiencing during these deployments. And it just adds to the stress. It's, it's another big rock in the backpack. You and Christine in particular experienced every parent's nightmare shortly before your 2008 deployment. Would you mind talking a little bit about that? It's uh, something that I think will help others understand how do I manage my own personal stress when I'm in the middle of a, of a combat deployment? Sure. Um, October 10th, 2007, we were having a birthday party for my two boys. Uh, one was turning one and one was turning three uh, right around the same time as each other. And uh, we were at a dad's house in San Diego area. Christine had gone to go to the store to get food and stuff for the party, which was happening the next day. Uh, they had a pool in there place and my younger son the one-year-old griffin he uh he loved water uh, but couldn't swim and uh, uh at one point he got into the pool and and ended up drowning and uh you know i i found him and i pulled him out i was doing cpr on him but he had been in the water probably at that point five minutes i think is where we were able to recreate and uh that was too long for uh for anybody but certainly for a child because their first thing when they hit the water is to breathe in mm-hmm. so they don't there's not even any breath holding so even if i could have gotten there a few minutes faster i don't know that things would have been any different but uh yeah so that was 10 days after excuse me that was october 20th i picked i became the fox company commander on october 10th so 10 days prior, and we had a long weekend, I think it was Columbus Day weekend, uh, right after I took over the company. And that was obviously a, a very hard blow. I'm, I'm at the point now, 12 years on, mm-hmm. I can talk about it without crying, but probably for the first 
eight years, I wouldn't be able to get be able to get that out. And I and I think that's I think that's part of it though is that I didn't stop talking about it and I didn't start mentioning it. And I know I'm sure a lot of the listeners don't know this, but uh, you were our chaplain uh, in two seven for the following deployment to Okinawa, which was a very a very different deployment from the one in Afghanistan. And uh, you know one of the things that I did is I came and saw you and I talked to you. And that was one of the ways that I helped process through that. And, uh, you know, I had a a friend of mine, he's a Vietnam veteran. Uh, He's actually my dad's best friend. He told me almost right after Griffin died, he had lost his wife. He said, you know, when you break a bone, you go see a doctor. When you lose something like a child or a loved one or something like that, it probably helps to, to go get help. And, uh, you know, that's something that stuck with me Yeah, that, uh, that you need to engage with somebody that mental health professionals are great. And, and I was, I was going to counseling as well. Both Christine and I were seeing the on-base counselor there in 29 Palms. And then we deploy. And, you know, for me, the, the most therapeutic thing was to be around my Marines, hmm. right? Because hmm. in, at that level, when you're in a leadership level like that, you're, it's like they're your kid brothers or your sons. You know, I don't know if I'm old enough to be their father at that point, but I'm certainly old enough to be their big brother. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, when you look at them that same way and, and, and care about them that same way, then it helps to be around that. So for yeah. me, kind of immersing in my Marines, which probably wasn't the most healthy thing for my marriage, it really got me through a lot. So just, you know, going back to the field, being around the Marines, focusing on something else was helpful. And, and yeah, I mean, I was compartmentalizing things and kind mm-hmm. of putting that hurt and pain in a place where I, I know at some point I had to deal with it. Right. But now was not the time. And, I, you know, something happened to me, too, or something came over me uh, when we were in. So we we deployed. You know, everything was going fine. And there was this point that we got to when we were sitting in Bastion slash Leatherneck, getting ready to push out to our position. So we were getting ready to go to Nowzat. And it's kind of like we'd done all the planning. We'd, we'd done a bunch of rehearsals. We're still rehearsing. But, you know, all the equipment was checked and double-checked and rechecked. And we were just kind of waiting. And that's when these thoughts started to creep into my mind. And it wasn't, it, you know, it wasn't, I'm sure it was, or depression, but what really concerned me at that point was like, holy crap, what if I get killed? Mm-hmm. Not, again, to talk about my concern for my own self-preservation, but I was thinking, what the hell is going to happen to my wife and kid? Yeah. Having just lost a child, my wife is pregnant now with our third child. What if I get killed now? Mm-hmm. I mean, we're only five months on from my son dying. Now what happens? And I moped around for a few days. And then we had a, there was a, a psychologist, a Navy psychologist making rounds to the different places. And uh, she introduced herself at one of the staff meetings. I was like, you know what? I should probably go talk to her. Mm-hmm. And so I sat down and I started talking with her. And she was very smart, very sharp, and everything was going swimmingly. And I told her what I was worried about, my concerns. She goes, it was a weird, another surreal moment. But she goes, oh, Ross, nothing's going to happen to you. Oh. And I go, what? And I didn't say it because she's a commander, too, you know, I'm a, <laughs> okay. I'm a captain. Yeah. But I was like, that is the dumbest fucking thing I've ever heard. Mm. But at the same time, I think it's exactly what I needed to hear. Not that what I said, what she said that I agreed with, but what I was like, well, yeah, I mean, what else am I going to do? There's no way anybody can tell this. You know, my wife is 10 times tougher than I am. Yeah. And she's going to be fine. Like whatever she, whatever happens, she'll continue to drive on and Mm -hmm. take care of, of this. And that's just really a credit to the person that she is. Yeah. And then I just let it go. And, you know, I, I know, Maybe, you know, not everybody would do something like that or look at it in that lens. But I, I really needed that psychologist to say something that stupid for me to 
and kind of realize like, oh yeah, dummy, what are you going to do? Are you going to quit? You going to go home? Because if, if I, I don't think, I don't think anybody would have given me any crap for going home. Mm-hmm. If I wanted to, you know, I said, look, you know, I can't do this. My family I just lost a kid, blah, blah, blah. I think everybody would have understood. But, but then you look down the road. Well, what would I think then? As mm-hmm. I'm sitting on the sidelines, either maybe they just kept me at battalion, switch spots with uh, the H&S company commander or, or some other billet that just does watch officer all the time. And I'm sitting there watching this happen, my Marines. The psychological effect that that would have on me, I probably would have ended up killing myself. Wow. You know, not being around my guys and assuming the same risk that they're assuming that I get a pass because I'm a captain and something horrible happened. But at the same Mm -hmm. time, like that's, it's not fair to them. You know, we have guys that lost parents and brother and siblings and all kinds of stuff. And, you know, they don't get to go home. So it was a reach down, grab a hold moment. And you need to, you know, answer this, you know, your responsibilities. Mm -hmm. so I I just kind of put it behind me pushing things down and compartmentalizing is not always good but I I think there's a human coping coping mechanism there that allows you that you can so you can go on and function right as a as a person as a marine you know as a leader at at any level not just officer senior enlisted or anything I mean you know the the fire team leader is going to have the same same issues so you know, we go on through the deployment and all those attacks that you and I were just talking about mm-hmm. occurred. And then we got to September. So our, our deployment ran from, we got there in late March and then we left in the beginning of, actually we got home December 1st. So March to December. So in September, uh, Ramadan occurred and all across Afghanistan, there were no offensive operations that were authorized. We could still patrol. We could still do more counterinsurgency actions, but not attacks, not raids, not clearing operations. What had kept me going through all that time was that I had an operation to plan constantly. And we didn't have the manpower to do it as frequently as we all wanted to. So we had to kind of take breaks to rest, refit, and get ready for the next attack. And so in that time, I was just constantly planning, either Mm -hmm. between planning our patrols and those operations that ended up shaping our our larger company operations that we conducted. So I always had something to do. My mind was always in motion in doing something. But when Ramadan hit, that all came to a screeching halt. And what we focused on, uh, primarily as a company was looking for as many IEDs as we could, we could find. So we had very deliberate operations where the engineers were the main effort. And I think we ended up finding in that month, I don't know, I think it was like 20 IEDs, not immediately around our fob, but as we branched out and pushed out more, you know, several IEDs. That's awesome. Yeah, it was. And it was good to do in the time that we had, you know, because we couldn't do those other larger operations. But for me, there wasn't a whole lot of planning going on. Mm -hmm. And I was planning operations for after Ramadan. And, you know, I was getting to that point where I was running out of things to do. And when that happened, that's when a lot of the weight of my son's death Mm -hmm. really hit me. And uh, I didn't really have anybody at that juncture to talk to i probably could have gone and talked to commander hancock i probably i know i could have talked to my first sergeant but at the same time everybody was having a hard time and i think trying i didn't want to burden anybody else with my issues and baggage Mm -hmm. um or send anybody to make them uneasy like oh crap you know what's happened in the shaw house like what's his problem you know are we going to be okay um you know, and I, I think I was talking to Christine about once a week, and I don't think I called her the whole month of September. Um, 
Mm. I just didn't want to. I would send, you know, we would email, you know, pretty frequently, try to get once a day to talk to her. But, you know, which in itself, like, that's not hardship, right? I mean, being able to email. My, my grandfather was in World War II, and they communicated once every two months via letter. When you expect it and you and you don't get it, I think that's where the challenge is for us, right? Sure. Yeah, it is. But I just didn't have anything to say, and I was so – I was depressed. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't think I would have said that at the time, but looking back, I had a bout of depression. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think I have depression, but I, right. I had a bout of it. And, and it was funny, like, as soon as October showed up, we're right back at it, and it's like I was able to push that back down and – I was fine, at least yeah. from my perspective. Maybe other people would have a different perspective. But, you know, we, we did a couple more operations. We've got some combat replacements. The 1st Marine Division untasked, put put together bodies and, and sent them to us. About, gosh, I guess it was probably just under 100 bodies that they sent, maybe less. Maybe it was about 40 or 50. But we got almost a whole platoon in Nalzad from all over the 1st Marine Division, volunteers. You know, we did a couple more operations, and and then we went home. For me, I think my probably my first four or five months, I don't I don't think I drank at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, my reaction when I don't feel right is I stay away from alcohol. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't drink a lot, but when I do, I'm usually a pretty happy guy, and I know that alcohol. I know this is true for anybody, but it amplifies whatever you're feeling, and I wasn't feeling yeah. well, and I didn't want that amplified. Yeah, smart decision, um, yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, I remember coming home after, and it, we were home over Christmas and New Year's, and I didn't, I didn't feel myself. But at the same time, I didn't, I, I wasn't going through depression. I wasn't having anxiety or anything about the deployment. It was just, I was in, a, I guess, kind of funk. And it's not that I didn't, I wouldn't engage people, but I didn't. I wasn't my normal self where I would go and be around our friends, you know, back here at home. Cause both my wife and I grew up in Idaho. Uh, we always planned to come back. We stayed, you know, in touch and, and close with all of our friends that we, I mean, I went to grade school, high school, college with, and same with her, our group of friends from college. We stayed close. We still get together and Christmas parties and new years and all that. Mm-hmm. And withdrawn is probably the right term. I would withdraw a little bit, but not, I didn't feel it was anything that was unhealthy. And I, I still don't feel it was unhealthy, but I just wasn't the same person. And people commented on that, you know, mm-hmm. they, um, I wasn't drinking at New Year's and people would come up and say like, hey, Ross, you want a beer? Want to do this? I was like, no, thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, and I just kind of sat and watched everybody and I would engage in conversation, but I wasn't actively going and, and joining that, which is different from the way I, I normally am uh, with this group of friends. And uh, so I, I got back to on Palms and I would make kind of routine stops at the, at the counseling center. For me, it just helped to talk to so like a, a disinterested third party mm-hmm. and not that they didn't care. It's just that they weren't connected to me and it was just somebody that I could talk to and a sounding board and then once we deployed for Okinawa, that's when you kind of became that sounding board for me. And, uh, you know, I mean, it was probably, what, two or three times that we uh, spoke. And and I mean, about my issues. I know we, we talked about other things. But mm-hmm. so, you know, I, throughout that time, I kind of got better at dealing with things and talking about them. And, you know, my wife and I would continue to talk about our son passed away. You know, my friends would ask, and I would I would be very forthcoming about it. Mm-hmm. But I, I think that was one of the things that that was that helped me it was my willingness to talk about it. Yeah. And and then having those confidants that I could reach out to and discuss these things in in kind of heartfelt ways and be, you know, the, the you have to be vulnerable, and that's not something. Marine and vulnerable are not two things that are not synonymous. You know, right. they're they're right. they're they're two words that don't go together. And you you know you can say the same thing about soldier, sailor, airman. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but you know we're not vulnerable. We're we're here to protect people, and people that are protectors aren't supposed to be vulnerable. Right. But you have to be, and 
there, you've got to kick the, the people around you that, at least what worked for me is that the people around me were concerned and they're ones that I could talk to about those things with my son. Now, the things that happened in Afghanistan, I didn't really share those, those people. I didn't share that a whole lot with my wife. There would be occasions where she would ask me kind of a poignant question and I would do my best to answer it more for her sake than mine, but it ended up helping me. Yeah. Again, not realizing at the time that it was, it was helping me. Mm -hmm. But that book that she wrote, it was eye opening for her because I didn't discuss a lot of the things that happened and she's asking me these questions. And and I felt Mm -hmm. in the book when she's asking me, because she interviewed me between our permanent change of station between Camp Pendleton and Virginia. And so I would drive and she would be on the computer and asking me questions about my deployments. And I think what changed or, or why I was willing to talk about those things was because she had sacrificed so much. Yeah. And I felt like I owed her this story that she really wanted to tell and not for her own personal satisfaction, but to really be able to explain to people what the current military spouse and servicemen and family are going through mm-hmm. in this period, in this, you know, the, the post 9-11 veteran period. So that's why I was probably more candid than I had been at any point in our relationship about this stuff because I felt I owed it to her. Mm-hmm. And, and that in itself and talking about some of the things and allowing her to ask those questions because as traumatic as things that happen to the serviceman or woman mm-hmm. that go on, there's a whole lot of other emotions that are going on back home. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah. And not that it's necessarily traumatic in the sense of a threat to your life, but that's got to be pretty difficult to sit back and wait to hear something and you hear about and see people coming back injured and or notices of people being killed. Mm-hmm. And, you know, our battalion, that deployment lost either 20 or just over 20 sailors, Marines. Uh, we lost a soldier that was attached to us, interpreters. And for those families, as, you know, as well, it's, it's such a trying time. And I think when we talked about the deployment in that manner that she – you know, it was therapeutic for her yeah. as well. Right. And, uh, you know, I think that's something that we get lost in all of this is how hard it is. And I know people know it's hard, right, that a deployment is hard on a family and the people that stay behind. But, you know, from a standpoint of your your mental health and, and from a psychological aspect, how what a toll that takes on a person to send a loved one off while you're raising a family. Uh, I certainly wasn't the only person that had a, a child was born while we were over there. I, I think we had like two or three in my company the same month my daughter was born mm-hmm. um, of guys going through that. And I know that was all over the battalion. So yeah, so it was helpful in, in going through that exercise with my wife um, and talking about our deployment in, in that way. Well, I love the way that the two of you have figured out a way to make it work. I mean, part of it was you each had to, compartmentalize what you were going through at home and selectively choose what you were going to communicate. But also, like you indicated, there's a time that you got to take that thing off the shelf that you've compartmentalized. Otherwise, it's going to eat you up. But but not only did you reach out, the two of you during that journey across country, but I'm sure uh, many times before and after, you experienced a level of transparency in your discussions that's critical because that transparency leads to, to building trust and intimacy in a marriage. And I think so many folks, like you said, that it, it's just so hard and difficult and they don't necessarily know how to broach a conversation or maybe they get upset, bitter, whatever, and that transparency really gets dialed back. They lose trust and they don't feel a sense of intimacy and they don't know why. And I just think, I mean, you guys went through such a a tragedy during a very difficult season, and I think it's just a great model of of how to endure and come out the other side and and not only survive, but really grow and thrive through it. You know, the two of you have such a a great relationship. I appreciate you sharing that. I know it's very personal, and I think think it would help just about anybody who's in a relationship who's listening to this. Well, I want to add to that, too. You know, you think about all the marriages that struggle and all the 
obstacles that they meet just from separate from a combat deployment, but just the normal pace of a deployment and or a cycle, a training cycle, working up to a deployment. Mm-hmm. For the everything that gets placed on the spouse, and I really think they don't get the credit they deserve. Yeah. In in handling things that go on at home, that the, the service personnel's job is so is so critical. Yet a lot of these spouses are single parents in effect because you're gone so much. You know, mm-hmm. it's not even it's not even the deployment; it's the training, working up for the deployment. And if you're in a leadership position, again, from from a fire team leader on up, yeah, your your time investment is so much greater than a, a normal nine to five job. I mean, at sixteen thirty. If we're lucky to get the Marines off at that time, Marines mm-hmm. and sailors off at that time, it's not where it ends for the leadership. That squad leader is going back and, you know, having to get rosters and information to the platoon sergeant who's got to get that information up, you know, to the first sergeant. And as you go up more, you can add more and more time that that leader is going to be there and the toll that it takes on the spouse, because now you're usually talking about people that have kids, you know, that that's falling on the shoulders of that spouse and then to yeah. go on a deployment and then come back and the frustration that she's felt and that, and I say she again, cause we're talking about all infantry and battalion of men, right? They end up, you know, wanting some kind of connection and, and that tell me what the, the sacrifice that you make as a serviceman and me as the spouse that not that she's saying her own sacrifice, but, the sacrifice that she's making, tell me what you did so I can understand what, you know, my job mm. allowed you to do or, you know, yeah. whatever else. And I, and I don't think they're thinking that, that, that the spouse is thinking in that way, right? you know, like you owe me this, but they want to just be part of that intimate part of their, your life and that, that they need you as the serviceman to share what you did to validate what, what they went through or help in validating that. I won't say that they need it, but I, I think it's that's where a lot of service personnel fail when they come back and talk to their spouse or don't talk to them and just shut down because the things that they went through are horrible and traumatic and they either don't want to relive it or anything else, but then that further alienates and shuts out the spouse that wants to be you know, a, a part of that intimate aspect of your life. And right. I think Marines and sailors make that mistake and, and shut them out mm. because it is painful and it's hard to talk about and you don't want to be vulnerable, but at some point you have to be, if you, if you want to maintain your marriage with your spouse. Yeah. And I, and I know people stick through it, you know, that, that once you've compartmentalized, you push that stuff down, it kind of helps to keep it down there a little bit. Maybe you're medicating a little bit to, keep it repressed only I don't think it really stays repressed when you medicate. Right. But you know, and, and to this day, like I don't stop going and I don't go routinely, but I still go to the, the VA and use their counseling services. You know, our, our brains and our, our emotions and our mental health are not the same. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, right. We're just, we're changed to the molecular level. We're changed. And, Little things like, so I've got a, a an issue with my neighbor. Uh, we just don't get along. Okay. And I don't think I have any of the classic issues of PTSD. But my my sleep since Afghanistan and, and other deployments, my sleep and my memory have been greatly affected. And sometimes I sleep really well, and then sometimes I don't. And I went through this bout because I got an argument with my neighbor over a fence line. You know, you know, like this is the the hard the hardships of of, of retirement. <laughs> right. you know, there, I'm I'm in an argument with my neighbor, and for whatever reason, I can't let it go when I go to bed at night. And I went right back to like the my most severe time when I was only sleeping three or four hours a night. And it wasn't that I couldn't go to sleep; it's I couldn't stay asleep. I'd go to sleep just fine, but then I'd wake up three or four in the morning and not be able to go back to sleep. Mm-hmm. It just it weighed on me this little inconsequential argument. It was an ongoing thing with my neighbor that I was like, you know what? I need to go. I need to go talk to somebody. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I went to 
the VA and talk to their uh, social worker, counselor at their mental mental health uh, clinic there and talk through all this stuff. I'd talk about all my deployments and kind of give them my history and everything else. And they're not even saying anything profound that's going to that's changed the way I think. But it, I found that just talking about that helped me. Yeah. And then when when I retired from the military and when we came back, we, we went to a place where we had a social network already there. Our, both our families are here. We have close friends and we've made other great friends in that time. And I think for me, that has been the other real important thing is just having a group of people that you trust, care about, and enjoy being around and can share things. To, to replicate, you can't completely bring back whatever you develop in the military and that closeness, whether you're on a ship or you're working an air crew or, you know, driving a truck or you're in a squad, an infantry unit. Yeah. You know, you just develop a bond there that you really can't have and replicate anywhere else. But you can come close to it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in Idaho, we've got a thing called Mission 43, which is a, a veterans, uh, the Albertsons Foundation. It's their veteran outreach program. And it's just fantastic. And it's not like, uh, it's not like the VFW. It's not, it's kind of a, you know, newer idea. And it's just got the servicemen from the Boise area and the, the larger metro- metropolitan area that we call the Treasure Valley. It's a place where you can connect and hang out and have a beer or not have a beer or go do something active, uh, physical or volunteer or find that other purpose and be around other veterans that are here that are maybe going through the same thing. And I've just found that to be, I really want to go to all those events mm-hmm. that they, that they host because I, I've gotten to know different veterans from all different backgrounds and services and ranks in in the military. And it's just, uh, it's fantastic. And and I I attribute that to kind of keeping this overall mental health training, you know, exercise for me. And that's, you know, the, the social aspect, the family aspect, being able to talk to somebody, having a medical professional that you can reach out to, you know, or, or clergy or, you know, something else. You know, I'm, I'm fortunate too in that, that my wife's cousins, two of her male cousins are, uh, are pastors mm-hmm. and here. And so it's family and it's people that are well versed and, and able to talk to people that have been through difficult times. You know, those are, those are two other resources that, that I would reach out to. Yeah. Uh, that's great. Uh, Mission 43, you said, uh, I can add that to the show notes. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a great organization and, and its focus is to help veterans transition in either education or networking through this. And, and a lot of my friends that are veterans are all, you know, we're middle aged guys have their own business or know people that have their own business. So right. as new veterans come in that are did a single enlistment or maybe two enlistments or something like that or and then got out, it's a good place to start networking right away for that transition purpose. So, you know, my, my take on things, um, and particularly when we talk about post-traumatic stress, you know, whether it's a disorder or it's, you know, something that that happens to you and, and you move on from it. You know, my philosophy on this is that PTSD, or PTSD is not a lifelong affliction. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's something that's curable. It, you know, and I guess that's probably easy for me to say since I said I didn't have it, but I've had mental health professionals tell me I have it. I just disagree with them. But I know that I have, I demonstrate some symptoms that, that go along with that. And, and I know, you know, I ask my wife, she will tell you I'm much more angry, um, quick to, to snap the things. I will admit to a level of, of vigilance that is probably not the most healthy, but I don't mind having that, you know, if we call it hypervigilance, I kind of enjoy it in a way. Uh, the only the only thing that kind of makes it when, when it would bother me is if I'm not, if I don't feel prepared for something. 
So mm-hmm. if I feel prepared for things and that hypervigilance to use the, the term, uh, kind of loosely, but I don't think it's a bad thing. I guess okay. what I'm trying to get at. Sure. So yeah, there are certainly some things that, uh, that I probably demonstrate that would put me in a, in a category somewhere along. If, if we look at post-traumatic stress as, as a spectrum, uh, there's probably points at which I've been far to the right of the, on the spectrum and as time and maturity and me seeking help and kind of taking control and taking action against the ways and and in the way that I feel, you know, I I think I've moved further left on the, on that spectrum. If, if we're looking at right being where it's becoming a disorder and to the left of just, you know, on that spectrum of managing it. But, you know, I, I believe that I think science supports this is, Post-traumatic stress is a natural reaction to a, a situation in which your life mm-hmm. is in danger or you have to take life or, absolutely, you know, you have to try to save one of your children or something else like that where you experience, to be Captain Obvious, trauma. And I think the way that we naturally go through that, and there's, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of history and science behind this because and we're not the first generation to fight a war. And, right. and, and people have been fighting since the caveman picked up the jawbone of a, of an ass and, and beat, you know, the next tribe over the head with it. You know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's something that's gone on. And, you know, a lot of that, that natural reaction to danger forces the body physically to act a certain way. You, you know, the angrier you are, the more vigilant you're going to be, yeah. the more aware you're going to be, the more anxiety that you have, the more concern, that's what fuels that hypervigilance. And so those are it is survival mechanisms. But, you know, humans were also set up to depend on one another and to seek protection. In, in, and I, I don't mean physical protection, but mm-hmm. that that healing and that protection from that anxiety or, or loneliness or anything else that that isn't good for humans in a, in a group of people. And that's why I think veterans feel so close to one another. You think about the situations that they're in. It's much like we were when humans were in caves. And that is you have a, a small, close-knit group of people that are surviving, are facing danger, you know, rather it's the saber tooth cat or eating the wrong food or whatever else, somebody's looking out for somebody. Somebody's standing watch. Mm-hmm. Everybody's asleep in the same room where you have that closeness to address that danger and your mind has now adopted this cycle of looking out, ad- assessing threats and determining what is threatening and how to act to that and act immediately. And then war ends, right? Your deployment ends. I guess war doesn't end, but your part in the war ends and you go home and now you're sleeping separately from those guys that you cared about, but your mind hasn't made that transition. You're still assessing threats. You're still looking for the bad guys. You're still thinking about all those things that you've conditioned your mind to to do, to look for IEDs, to look at terrain a certain way. Mm -hmm. But we haven't, we haven't pulled that back together with your, you know, your tribe that you have. And now we're all alone. And now you're facing all those hardships plus what you've trained your body or the situation has trained your body. And you don't know how to react to that, those things. And you don't have that support system around Mm -hmm. Um, or you don't make the effort to develop that support system or talk with your spouse who wants to be a part of your life and understand what you went through, but you don't want to maybe subject that person to your, you know, the horrible things that happen, or you don't want to share those things because they're so painful to bring up. And and it's a vicious cycle of not doing that. But I I believe that post-traumatic stress is something that 
helps us cope with those things and that in that time it makes us stronger mm-hmm. you know it, it it develops like you look at the the suicide rates for the united states you know, we're living in the easiest best times of our lives with regard to longevity medicine free time you know all this wonderful things about modern society yet we have such a, a high suicide rate Mm-hmm. compared to places where people eat by every day, may not know where their next meal's coming from, if they're not committing suicide. Right. But they're building their resiliency every day. And what we consider hardship in the United States, and I'm I'm saying this separate from the veteran community, because most veterans have experienced that level of hardship, you know, people aren't building that resiliency. Yeah, you know, if I could uh, reference a book that you recommended to me, uh, Tribe by Sebastian Younger, a well-known journalist. Um, on that note, he said, uh, whatever the technological advances of modern society, and they're nearly miraculous, the individual lifestyles that those technologies spawn seem to be deeply brutalizing to the human spirit. And he's speaking exactly to the kind of dynamic that you're talking about, how we seem to be so more, so so much further advanced than we've ever been. And when you want to talk about suicide, where we throw so much more at the suicide issue than we ever have, and yet the rate continues to go up. And then you look at, like you said, some of these other places where they may not be doing well, or life may be significantly more stressful, but the community bonds or tribal bonds uh, that are usually forged around stress is what keeps them together and mentally healthy. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think that's why when you see reunions of service personnel or, you know, probably even policemen and firemen, every other place where you experience that hardship, um, the bonds there are so incredible. And it's, you know, it's so, I, I went to a, a Vietnam reunion of Fox 27. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it was it was so impressive, and, and this was just a year removed from our time in Afghanistan, uh, to see the closeness of these men and, and and the dedication that they had to to one another. And it's no different than what modern day veterans experience. But I think they've got to make that effort too to make those connections to the people that they are close with. Mm-hmm. And we, we've got a lot of tools. I yeah. mean, you know, social media for all it's unsavory things that go on uh, and the anonymity that provides people that are are less than productive. There's some great aspects of it. And and I've seen a few of the Marines really use that and reach out to guys and just even to start a conversation about something, you know, rather it's like, Hey, tell me about your favorite leader or, Hey, do you guys ever run into this? And, and, you know, to, to see the threads that go along with, with that and people talking about, you know, when they run into something or somebody saying, I, Hey, I'm having a lot of problems right now. And guys start reaching out or they're concerned about somebody, you know, maybe two buddies, one lives in Chicago and one lives in Los Angeles and they talk all the time. And one of them says something that's very concerning that you know, about, so say it's the guy in Chicago that's having a rough spell, you know, that guy in LA will get a hold of, other guys in Chicago to say, Hey, somebody go pay a visit to this guy. Yeah. And, you know, that's having a problem right now. One of our brothers is having a problem and, and they do that. Like they reach out to him and, and, uh, you know, it's fantastic to see, but that's what needs to happen before we get to the point of an emergency where, Hey, this guy just went off the net. His wife's saying he's got, you know, he's, he's really depressed and he's yeah. upset. And, yeah. you know, I, we've lost, I lost two guys. Thank God it was only two. Still tragic nonetheless, but we've lost seven in my company alone uh, mm-hmm. to suicide mm. after the fact. Um, wow. And, uh, you know, I, I, there's some factors there. Certainly alcohol or prescription meds or illegal drugs are all in that mix. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think anybody's done something you know, without being medicated. And, 
it's not just the what happened overseas. It's the compounding of you know the the stress of of either job or not having a job or not having the financial ability and not feeling that that they're uh, they're doing their part and that they're a burden or whatever else. But getting to somebody at that point where they feel that way and it's valid to feel that way. And I think that's something that people understand that even though they accomplish so much overseas or over in the military, it doesn't mean that you don't fall and it doesn't mean that you don't have hard times and and that you feel that, you know, I'm, I'm working a job that anybody could do. And this isn't anywhere close to the responsibility that I had when I was overseas and getting back to that point. It's, it's depressing and it hurts, but the thing is, is just like every single thing that we've ever been taught in the military is to face your enemy head on. Yeah. Right. To to address that in a violent high tempo manner and not surrender. You don't give up in the face of the enemy. And, and we don't do that when we, when we are presented with hardship and you have to, address it. And and the other part of that is, is there's never a time in anybody in the military, particularly the Marine Corps, where you go somewhere without somebody, Yeah. right? You have desert buddies, you have mountain buddies, you have whatever kind of shipmates and, and everything else that you travel with, you know, rather you're in 29 Palms, you're just going to the head, you have to go with somebody, mm-hmm. right? You go on Liberty in Pattaya, Thailand, you have to have limo buddies. It's the same thing when you when you're presented with these problems. Rather, you're charging into a machine gun position that you're you and your buddy are firing and moving towards because that's that's the base unit of of anything is the buddy pair. Right. You know, somebody's shooting while somebody's moving forward. Somebody's firing while you're reloading. Mm-hmm. Somebody's firing while you're prepping a grenade. That buddy is a recipe for life and when you get to a point where you're struggling and having problems with, with your own health, your psychological health, then you need to get somebody. You need to ask for help and you need to get that buddy that while you take a knee can help you and move you forward and cover you. Yeah. And, and there's no shame in that. To me, the shame comes from not getting help and letting whatever is bothering you affect the people that you care about. Uh, well put. That to me is where there is is failure, where there is shame. You know, you're going to feel a certain way. Everybody that goes through a traumatic event, again, rather it's losing somebody you care about in a car accident or a drowning accident or in combat, you're going to go through a, a very specific set of symptoms that can be helped, that can be addressed and can be helped, but you have to be the one to address it head on, understand you can't do it yourself all the time and ask for help. Ask somebody for that because that's that to me is where courage exists, is yeah. doing something that you don't want to do and reaching out to somebody even though it's hard. Yeah. Even though you may feel that it, you know, personally, that it makes you feel weaker. But I don't believe that at all. I, yeah. I think where the weakness comes in is where people refuse help, refuse to open up to their spouse or get help on behalf of their family. Yeah, yeah, and, absolutely right. And then crawl into whatever numbs them of, of whatever pain they're feeling. Mm, well put. Wow, that's great. I love everything you had to say, and it reminds me of one of the first things I ever learned back in the 90s working with Marines, which is when you're on a patrol and you're ambushed, you turn to and you run through. You don't sit there in the enemy's reticle just buttoning up, hoping and praying that they're not going to take you out. You know, right. If you ever got a choice to, to to button up or to push forward, it sounds like you recommend pushing forward. Right. Well, I mean, because what are the chances – your chances of you standing still and being a target are you're, you're, you have a greater chance of dying. At least you may still die if you get up and push forward, but you've got a better chance. If you're 
spitting rounds back at them and making them flinch just enough or buy you some time to get out of that kill zone. Yeah. You, you have to, you have to turn and face your, your problems directly. And I know that's, you know, it's easy to say, Mm -hmm. but at any point when I, and, and I, and I, and I'm saying I didn't always do it right. You know, when I talk about that time in Afghanistan, it was Ramadan and, and all I did was, you know, I, my, my response was not to talk to my wife, right? which she probably needed more than I did. Mm. And, and then push those feelings down. Like that's not healthy, but yeah. you have to do that sometimes. Like there are times when you, the situation dictates that you have to push some things aside and address this and then, you know, ideally come back to it and address those uh, the issues that you're having the right way. And yeah, uh, I'm not saying I always did it the right way, but I, I certainly tried. And that when there are points when I wasn't feeling myself, then I knew I had to do something. And sometimes yeah. that takes my wife going, Hey, you are more angry than normal mm-hmm. and you are getting on the kids too much and it's affecting your relationship with them. You need to do something. Mm-hmm. And you know, you have to be able to listen to that. And you don't want yeah. to hear those things. You always want to hear, like, I'm in control of my emotions. Right. Don't you tell me I'm, you know, Mr. Tough Guy combat veteran. But the reality is, is you have to be able to step back and listen to, to what people are saying or what you're what you're saying and, and address it. Yeah. That's the point in all of this is that you have to ad- address what is affecting you. If that means you go to your pastor, fantastic. If it means that you go to your wife or husband, then do that. If yeah. it means whatever, whatever works. And if it's not working, then you need to adjust. Mm-hmm. I love that part too, that it, it doesn't, it may not take courage to, to button up. It may take more courage to reach out and get help. But that's what that means is that's a sign of strength to actually go out and ask for help. It's not a sign of weakness and that you need that buddy, whether that buddy's a a pastor or a spouse or a good friend or that fire team to support you just like you did in combat to, to, to cover you during your movement or when you're trying to sort things out or reload or whatever. And wow. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. Well, I love, you know, that, that term and it gets used a lot more is like, Hey, you need to take a knee. Mm-hmm. You know, I had, I had my I had commanders telling me that after my son died, mm-hmm. you know, and I moved on from two seven, I was at SOI and, and one of my battalion commanders come up to me, put his hand on my shoulder and say, hey, Ross, sometimes we just need to take a knee. Yeah. And I think you're probably at that point right now where you need to just take a knee for a little bit. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's that was that, that was a great teaching moment, not just because of what that person did for me, but how that educated me on how sometimes you need to look out for Marines. Because... You know, the institution, the Marine Corps, the Navy, the Air Force, the Army is not going to look out for that individual. That's not their job. They, they can't do that. Right. It's the, the people in that organization that have those ties to their subordinates, to their, well, even to their leaders mm-hmm. that, that look out for them and recognize those things. And, you know, it doesn't change, necessarily change the civilian world either. You know, I've been working a, a job for two years now and I have. They're great. I have great coworkers and a good boss, and and you know they still do some of those same things. Not not quite on the same level, or you know understanding the same gravity of things, but nonetheless, I mean it's, it's still it's it's not just military. It's human nature to to look out for people that, that yeah. you generally care about. Yeah, absolutely. Ross, I think that that is a great note to wrap up this conversation. I mean, I I would love to to chat more and maybe we can do that again in the future. But for now, I think you've ended on some fantastic lessons learned, some take home points, some actionable points. I thank you for taking the time to talk with me today. And I think there's a lot of folks who are going to hear this, make points of contact with their own life and find themselves both encouraged and, and challenged. Thanks so much. You bet chaps. And thank you for doing this. I, I think this is a worthy endeavor. And uh, I hope, you know, through what you're doing, it does reach out to those guys that may be struggling and gals that are struggling to, to kind of find their way and, mm-hmm. and maybe have reservations about the way their life's going right now. So I really appreciate what you're doing. Well, thanks, brother.